Okay, Aurora, we are back for the second part of the lecture. Okay, great. And if you have come up with any questions, um, in the meantime, let me know, and I'm happy to go back to um, other parts of the lecture. Okay, so, so far we've talked about the part of the spectrograph that splits the light up into the different wavelengths. And next, we need to talk about how we actually um, measure the different photons once we've split them into different wavelengths. So um, we need some way of counting the photons and um, recording that. And um, that's the detector. And there's different types of detectors for different types of wavelengths. And so in the optical, in the near infrared, in the UV, and in the X-ray, um, detectors usually treat radiation as individual photons. And the type of detector that we're going to be talking about today is the CCD, which is um, a charge coupled device. And this is used both for the optical and for the near infrared. So the high resolution spectrographs that we'll be covering in this um, course are both, uh, they both use um, CCDs. And Aurora, for, yep. we have a question uh, for you here. It's from Armando Lara again. Mm -hmm. He's asking, since we could expect that only few photons reach the slit, the number of mirrors inside the spectrometer affect, I guess it affects in some way, the amount of flux measured? Um, so the, if, if I understand the question correctly, I think that you're asking, um, what are the what's the purpose of all of the mirrors inside and so basically um in order to build the spectrograph you kind of need to have it in a box um, or some sort of compact instrument that can be easily placed onto a telescope um, and so all of the mirrors inside the um in, in the picture that I showed before. Um, those are basically to direct the light into the, direct the light into the different um, uh, collimators and um, gratings and then onto the camera. Um, and so the mirrors, they should be basically uh, not losing any light and not changing the path of the light. Um, or sorry, not changing the um, angle of incidence of the light, but just changing the path of the light so it can be directed um, in a kind of a compact design into the correct areas. I, I guess that the question maybe is related with the loss of the intensity through the whole system, I guess. Ah, okay. Um... You are receiving few photons from uh, outer space and then they will go pass through all these uh, slits and, and mirrors yeah, and everything. Yeah. So did, did you lose any kind of intensity while the photons are passing through? Yeah, um, so right, the you definitely are losing photons, um, both like you said, through the slit and then um, in, by, by in the shell grating, um, some of the photons are not the ones that are uh, the ones that are being collected. Um, and uh, yeah, so you're definitely losing them. The mirrors, they should design, they should help you to not lose um, any of the photons that you specifically want to collect. Um, yeah, so you definitely are losing photons um, from the source, from the sky. And again, this is one of the other reasons why we need to, uh, for high resolution, uh, you need to look at really bright sources. And even then you still need to have pretty long exposure times because you are losing a bunch of photons. The mirrors and the designs are designed to try to lose as few photons as possible, but um, it's, yeah, definitely not perfect. Um, and for the slit itself, um, uh, you want a pretty narrow slit because you do want to, in that even initial step, to spread the light out um, and so uh, actually for um, a lot of these high resolution spectrographs, you can choose the size of your slit based on how high of a resolution that you need. Um, and so if you only need a resolution of 12,000, you can choose a slightly larger slit so you get more photons. If you need the highest resolution, you want the narrowest slit. 
and you're going to lose a lot more photons that way. Um, but uh, yeah, you need to do that if you want the highest resolution. Okay. Uh, and um, if the if that doesn't completely answer your question, I'm happy to, if you want to ask it again, I can try to answer better. Um, okay, so going back to detectors. Um, so uh, in radio instrumentation, which I won't be talking about today because I don't know that much about, um, but uh, yeah, you don't use charge coupling devices and um, radiation is treated as continuous waves. Okay, so CCDs are um, uh, used in basically all imaging and spectroscopy in the visible and the near infrared. And um, they were invented in the late 1960s. And so, um, again, uh, another one of these technologies that is necessary for high resolution spectroscopy um, that started in the 19 late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, and CCDs are just so much better than what we used before. So before we used photographic plates and um, the quantum efficiency can tell you a lot about um, how efficient these things are at, um, at detecting photons. Um, and so uh, these numbers are pretty cool, um, that the human eye basically has a quantum efficiency of 1% to 3%. So that means out of the photons that hit your eye, only 1% to 3% um, are actually uh, detected and are actually what you see. Um, photographic plates have a quantum efficiency that's pretty similar actually to the human eye and they have an efficiency of about 5%. But um, for CCDs, this new technology, they can have quantum efficiencies um, of greater than 90%. So that means that almost every photon that hits um, your detector will actually get counted. And this is really important um, for high resolution spectroscopy because again, um, like the question said, and like we've been talking about this whole time, um, you wanna make sure that every photon is counted or else you would need an unreasonable amount of time to get these high resolution spectra. <clears throat> okay, so um, what a CCD does is um, it basically collects electrons um, that are excited into higher energy states when a detector is struck by a photon. Um, and that's kind of, uh, very similar to something that you might remember from your intro physics classes, which is the photoelectric effect. And so as a reminder, the photoelectric effect, um, uh, Einstein actually won a Nobel Prize for discovering the photoelectric effect. And um, if you have some sort of metal surface and you shine a light on it, um, which has photons, when the photons hit the surface, um, if the photons have a high enough energy, an electron is ejected from the surface. And as you increase the intensity, basically we have more photons that hit the source and we get more electrons that are ejected. And, um, but the photon needs to have a certain, num a certain energy. Um, if the photon has an energy that's too low, even if you shine um, a very intense light on it, if the photon's energy is too low, it won't eject an electron. Um, and so this is kind of, yeah, part of the proof of that photons or that light can be thought of as photons or particles. And um, each metal has a different work function. And the work function basically means um, what's the binding energy or the excitation energy of electrons. Um, and so each metal, um, electrons can be ejected uh, with different energies. Um, and so some are easier to eject um, with lower energies and some are easier to, or, or you need a much higher energy to eject the electron. And so here, we're not actually ejecting electrons, but we're exciting electrons into a higher state when they're hit by a photon. <clears throat> okay, so um, to actually build the CCD, um, you want to build it onto a wafer. So that's what this pattern here is. Um, you get all of these different, um, uh, yeah, you can think they're pixels basically. Um, and each one, uh, 
Yeah, so this is the whole area um, and each one is made out of the same type of metal, um, but there's different um, uh, material that separates them. And so you can actually localize um, where the photon is hit. Um, actually, I'll go into a bit more detail here. Um, and so when the photon is uh, hit and the electron is excited, um, then we send you send a signal um, in uh, you send a, a, a charge and you can tell where the electron which place the electron has been excited um, and then as you send the signal down um, the signal uh, is converted into a charge and then this charge is amplified here on the on chip amplifier and um, then it's converted into a count. Um, and this is what the computer picks up. Um, <clears throat> and just thinking about the photoelectric effect, you can already kind of intuitively think that you might need a different type of detector for near infrared and for optical um, because uh, the wavelength of the light determines how electrons or if electrons can be excited or not. Um, and in the optical, um, CCDs have been used for a while, since the 1960s. Um, but it wasn't until recently that we've been able to make good CCDs for the near infrared. Because infrared light, it often doesn't have enough energy to excite the electrons in the metals um, that we make the optical CCDs out of. And so opt optical CCDs are often made out of silicon, and near infrared CCDs are often made out of um, mixture between mercury and, oh shoot, I forgot to look up what these two other um, <laughs> atoms are, um, but it's some sort of a mercury mixture. Um, and I'll look that up and let you know later. <laughs> okay, um, and now just thinking about how CCDs are made again, um, we can start to, uh, this is kind of moving into the next lecture where we talk about um, what are the different noise sources on CCDs. And um, dark current uh, is an important noise source for CCDs. And that's basically that you can get um, thermal excitations of electrons. So um, any sort of heat that comes in um, has a photon associated with it, and um, or, or any sort of heat that comes in um, you can actually excite the electron because of this heat. And then the CCD will think that a photon from your target source has hit the detector, when in reality, it's just some sort of thermal um, excitation. And um, that's why you need to keep CCDs really cold. Um, and this is especially important for near infrared because um, if the detector is sensitive, to electrons um, in the mid-infrared or near-infrared. Um, humans emit uh, black body radiation photons um, at these wavelengths. And so you need to keep these instruments really, really, really cold um, so that, uh, and, and separated from the outside environment so that um, photons from humans or from the heat outside or from heat of parts moving around don't cause spurious detections or don't have electrons being excited. <clears throat> and so um, we'll talk about this more tomorrow, but in order to calibrate this, um, we take images when the shutters are closed um, and then we can subtract this out. <clears throat> Um, and also um, there's read noise. And so for read noise, basically there's some sort of uncertainty or noise that occurs when the electron is digitized um, during the um, amplifying process. Um, and so some sort of noise associated with this um, can affect the CCDs. But in reality, actually this read noise is usually pretty small um, and dark current is usually um, a lot bigger of a problem. Um, and so, um, yeah, read noise is usually not that big of a problem. Um, we've kind of figured out how to make CCDs um, good enough that uh, read noise isn't usually that much of a problem. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, and uh, so now that we've kind of talked about the detectors and the instruments that we're going to be using, um, I wanted to just kind of give you a brief overview of the instruments that are currently in use and when they came online. So when we've been able to start using um, these high resolution spectrographs. Um, and we'll be using some of this for our workshop classes later. So the three instruments that are in green here, um, I'm going to show you how to access those data. Um, and we'll be looking at some of that data in the uh, workshop class later. But um, these are kind of, uh, uh, I think a mostly comprehensive list. So I think this is most of the visible high resolution spectrographs that are currently in use. And um, uh, you can see that high res, um, which is on Keck in Hawaii, was the first one of these types of instruments. And it came along in 1996. So before 1996, um, we really didn't have this type of high resolution, wide wavelength coverage, um, a shell spectrograph like we've been talking about this whole class. Um, and since then, uh, we've, we've, you know, in the early 2000s and um, late 2000s, uh, late, late recently, um, there's been a lot more of these types of instruments. Um, especially a lot of them are focused on doing radial velocity follow-up of exoplanets. And in the near infrared wavelengths, um, what's uh, kind of interesting is you can now see that there was a bit of a lag between when we were able to make high resolution optical spectrographs and when we've been able to make high resolution near infrared spectrographs. Um, and so some of the first high resolution near infrared spectrographs um, started in the late 2000, in late 2000, so like 2014, um, we have iGRINS, which is the one that I showed you in the previous picture. I showed you um, the optical path of the light through iGRINS. And before that, we actually did have a few high resolution spectrographs. Um, so we had near spec on Keck, which has had a resolution of about 12,000. And that was kind of the highest resolution that we could get in the near infrared. Um, but iGRINS kind of was one of the first ones where we had resolutions that are comparable to optical spectrographs. So resolution of um, 45,000 for iGRINS. And um, recently we've been getting a lot better at this and um, Spiru is uh, extremely high wavelength coverage and has um, a resolution of like over 90, of about 90,000, I think. Um, and so uh, that's really high resolution for uh, near infrared wavelengths. And um, again, um, the two green ones are ones that um, we'll be looking at later. Um, they have publicly available archives that are pretty easy to use. So we'll be going through those later during the uh, workshop part of the class. <clears throat> okay. So um, this is kind of the end of the part of the lecture on the detectors and the spectrographs and the instruments that we're gonna be using for the rest of the class. And I've made a Kahoot quiz that kind of uh, goes over some of these and topics and hopefully will help you kind of internalize and um, think about orders of magnitudes and that type of thing. <clears throat> so um, if you have questions, let me know in the chat. So I'll wait a minute and then um, I'll put up the Kahoot screen so you can sign on while we're waiting. Hi, Laura. No, so far we have no questions yet. Okay, okay that's fine. Um, I'm going to put up the Kahoot screen so they can sign in. Um, but uh, if We'll wait a few minutes so they can sign in for that. If somebody has questions in the meantime, I can answer them. Okay. Okay. Let me share the screen that has the, oh, it's making noise. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, so um, if you now can just go to www.kahoot.it and you can enter in this game pin. Um, we'll wait a few minutes so everybody can sign on and then we can do the Kahoot quiz. All right, if you want, in the upper left, you see that there is a volume icon. You uh -huh. can just turn it off. Perfect. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. No, you're welcome. Let's see if they go to the Kahoot. I will just write down here. IT. I just passed the information yeah. to the YouTube channel so they can know which one is the web address and the PIN number they have to use. There you go. You have the first one. Yay. <laughs> Um, I think I'll wait another minute or two since I think people are still coming in. All right, I think I'll start now. Okay. So I can read them for you. What is most likely causing the red circled feature in this resolution 200 spectrum? Um, is it absorption from an element, emission from an element, absorption from molecules, or emission from molecules? Okay, 
So in a uh, resolution 200 spectrum, um, a large feature like that is going to be an emission from a molecule. An element wouldn't be able to make a feature, a single element wouldn't be able to make a feature um, that's that big. And so in resolution 200 spectra, most of what we see are features from um, molecules or sometimes a really strong element if it's like hydrogen or something. Um, and since this is an M dwarf, most of the features are actually molecules. <clears throat> Oh, and uh, it's absorption um, because in a stellar spectrum, um, you have black body um, emission, and then any sort of elements or molecules that are in the atmosphere are going to absorb that light. And we'll go more into um, the how spectra are made um, in a later class. But um, this is just kind of to get a feel about what a resolution 200 spectrum is usually showing. Okay. Um, so if a near infrared and a visible spectrograph have the same spectral resolution, which of them has a smaller wavelength spacing? So which has a smaller delta lambda? <clears throat> Is it the near infrared, the visible, or do they have the same spectral resolution? Um, and for this, you uh, will need the spectral resolution equation. Um, so if you don't remember it, it's R equals lambda over delta lambda. Okay, um, yeah, this was a bit of a tricky one, um, but I think that it's important to remember that um, the resolution doesn't uh, directly correlate to the wavelength spacing. It also has to do with the wavelength of light. Um, and so uh, the equation that you needed to um, remember or hopefully uh, look up, um, next time I'll write the equation in this uh, question. I realize I probably should have done that. Um, is that R equals lambda over the change in wavelength spacing. So if R is the same for a visible and a near infrared spectrograph, if you have a certain wavelength, um, if visible, visible has a shorter wavelength, <clears throat> visible has a smaller wavelength. And so the change in wavelength also has to be smaller um, for it to have the same resolution. Okay, next. True or false? You can use the same spectrograph, so detector and um, uh, light dispersing elements to create a near infrared and a UV spectrum. So again, this is both the dispersing element plus the detector or the CCD.
Yeah, so um, you need to use a different uh, CCD for sure um, to split the light, oh, sorry, to um, uh, detect the light because for near infrared and for UV, um, the wavelength of the light and the energy of the photon corresponds to the work function. And so CCDs will need different materials to detect photons from near infrared light than from UV light. So good job, I think most of you got that one. Um, if red light and blue light are both sent through a diffraction grating, which one will be more spread out afterwards? The red light or the blue light? Sorry, I think I gave a really long time for this question by accident. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the red light will be um, more spread out um, afterwards. And um, if you remember the uh, diffraction equation, um, that would have helped you. And uh, yeah, next time I'll put the equations that would have helped you on here. Um, By looking at lower orders, so um, smaller orders, you can increase the spectral resolution. Is that true or false? Oh, and I should say here, um, uh, yeah, I don't mean um, negative orders. <laughs> uh, I'm just talking about um, a lower order would be like a zero or one, whereas a higher order would be like 10 to 20 or something like that. Um, I just realized that might have been confusing because lower orders could also be interpreted as negative numbers. Um, but yeah, the M equals um, zero order, the light is not spread out at all. And um, the M equals one order or the M equals two order, um, the light is being more spread out and you get higher spectral resolution as you look at um, larger M's um, or larger orders. And that's why we use the Echel grading is because it prioritizes um, orders that have a, uh, 
it, it prioritizes the light going into the higher orders um, and therefore increases the spectral resolution. All right. Why are Ischel spectrographs good at creating high resolution spectra? Oops, I kind of just said this. They transmit more light. They reduce low frequency noise. They optimize transmission of lower orders. They optimize transmission of higher orders. Oh, good. Yes, most people got this. Yeah, they optimize transmission to higher orders. So um, like I said um, a, a minute ago, um, the shell spectrographs, um, they uh, by having a blaze angle, more of the light goes into higher M or more uh, uh, orders that split the light into um, wavelengths um, in smaller spacing. Okay. Um, so it'll be a plot. Um, this plot shows a CCD from a high resolution spectrograph. Does each row represent a separate order, a small part of one order, two orders, or the number of orders given by the spectral resolution? Oh, I tricked you. <laughs> um, so each row on here is a single order. Um, and uh, the number of orders given by the spectral resolution, um, yeah, the, the spectral resolution doesn't really say anything about the orders. It tells you about the wavelength spacing. Um, and the order is basically um, the uh, in the diffraction equation. It's the M um, in the diffraction equation. equation. Um, and so, yeah, each uh, row here is a separate order. And what was also um, interesting on the plot is you can see at the top, you have the redder um, orders and they were spread out more than the bluer orders. And so this goes back to, again, that um, the redder light gets spread out more than the bluer light when it goes through um, gratings. Okay, how do CCDs work? Um, CCDs, uh, so for CCDs, the interference pattern of light waves are detected, um, or a computer counts the photons, or photons excite electrons and the electrons are then counted, or photons de-excite electrons so that the photons are counted.
Okay, great. Yes, uh, almost everybody got this. So like the photoelectric effect, um, photons excite electrons and then the electrons are counted. And they're counted um, by sending electromagnetic radiation through the CCD. And then um, last, why, uh, why do CCDs need to be kept cold? Actually, there's one more question after this. Um, so that light waves are not distorted, so that thermal photons don't excite the electrons to reduce the read noise or to reduce the sky background. Yes, great. Um, so that for thermal photons don't excite the electrons, exactly. So that um, uh, any electrons from humans or moving parts or anything like that um, don't excite the electrons and cause a spurious signal. Okay, so which should be kept colder, a near infrared or an optical CCD? or which one is it more important to keep cold is another way um, to ask the same question. Yeah, so it's more important to keep the near infrared um, CCD colder because um, uh, in order to have a near infrared CCD, it needs to be able to excite electrons with near infrared or longer wavelengths. Um, and so there's a lot more um, photons coming from like humans or um, uh, any other thermal source that have near infrared wavelengths. And so it's especially important that you keep near infrared CCDs cold. Um, so it seems like most of you got that, so that's great. Okay, so um, for the last three questions, I just wanted, there's no, it's gonna tell you there's a right answer and a wrong answer. Um, but uh, I just wanted to know if you've had any experience with Python um, in astronomy classes before. Um, maybe I will play that one again after or something. I wonder if I can do that. Hmm. Okay, maybe not. I didn't have that one go on for long enough. <laughs> um, and then I was wondering if you've ever worked with spectral data before. So no, um, yes, once or twice, or yes, a few times.
Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I need to make the times longer since there's a delay. Okay. Um, so actually, if you could just comment in the YouTube video, um, the answers to these questions, that would be great. Um, if you have experience with Python, and if you have any experience with spectral data, since um, I made these ones shorter. Um, and last, I was wondering if you've used FITS files before. And again, you can comment in the uh, in the chat if you have an answer so that I know. All right. Okay. So that was it for the Kahoot quiz. Um, and sorry about having the 20 second delay, which gave you basically uh, a bit less time um, to answer the questions. But um, it was a really nice job. Um, and if you want to ask any more questions, ask them in the chat so I can elaborate on some answers. And there's like eight minutes before the next session. Um, I'm going to stop sharing this. Um, it seems like um, it seems like uh, people understood the CCD part of the lecture more because I think I went a bit slower um, than the uh, spectra spectrometer part of the lecture. Um, so maybe I will just um, go through a few of the slides about the spectrometer part of the lecture um, in the last like five minutes. unless anybody has specific questions. Okay, I think I'll just do that. Okay, um, so just to review a few of the things that I think I went a little bit too fast on. Great, I'll do Okay, so the gradings again. Um, and then yeah, one or two other things about that. So um, for the gradings, basically you have incident light and it's passing through the grading. Um, and this is the exact same thing as the reflection grading. I just think it's a bit easier to picture on the diffraction grading since the light passing through and we've all like thought of the slit experiments and stuff. Um, and so the M equals zero order is the um, order where most of the light goes in a grading where the light is coming in at an incident. So, or sorry, is coming in like at the exact same angle. Um, so most of the light is going to go to the M equals zero order. Less of the light will go into the M equals one order. And for the grading equation, the spacing between the grading, um, so that's D, you can see over here, we have D um, times the sine of the uh, angle theta. So the angle theta is basically how spread out the light is going to be, um, is equal to the orders times the wavelength. <clears throat> No, I don't want to play the video. And then just um, again, because uh, this is, I think, a bit important. Um, now, if we talk about the same gradings for multiple different wavelengths. So here, this is showing the red and the blue together. Um, if you have red and blue light coming in together at the zeroth order, um, the M equals zero order here on a flat grading, um, you're going to have the red and the blue light together. There's no separation of wavelengths. But as you go to higher order, so here's the M equals one order, you're gonna see the blue um, is a bit closer and then the red is has a, a higher angle. Um, and so it's a bit more spread out. <clears throat> 
And then as we go to even higher order, so here's the M equals two order, here's the M equals two for the blue light, and here's the M equals two for the red light. And so it's important to see that um, the red light is spread out even more than the blue light is. So here's our difference between the red light and here's our difference between the blue light. And um, the higher the order, the more spread out the light will be. And so here's an example from real uh, from a real uh, grading. And here's our uh, not spread out light and our M equals one order. Um, you get it a bit more spread out. And in M equals two order, it's even farther spread out. And for the shell gratings, um, the important thing here is that we have a blaze angle. And so each of these surfaces is at an angle. And so light is now going to be coming in at some angle to that surface. And the amount of um, maximum, um, so the, the order that's going to get the largest light is now not the M equals zero order. Here's the M equals zero order coming out over here. And the, the order that's going to be the strongest is the light that's going to come in at the same angle as the um, incident light went in at. So if the incident light comes in at this type of angle, the order that's going to have the most light coming out is the one over here. And so this is why we can maximize um, higher orders to have more light. And the higher the order, if you remember from the last slide, we're going to have um, the larger the separation between the wavelengths, which means the larger the spectral um, resolution uh, or the smaller the wavelength spacing. Um, so hopefully going over those few slides again um, made it a bit better and um, I'll go a bit slower uh, next time. Aurora, you have one question uh, okay. here. I'll pass it to you. It's uh, from Armando, and it's uh, are molecular absorption lines wider and deeper than atomic lines? Mm, okay, yeah. So we'll definitely um, go over the difference between molecular absorption lines and atomic absorption lines in lecture three. Um, basically, we're going to do spectra um, for that whole lecture. And so I just kind of wanted to give you a taste of that now. Um, oops, this one is, I think, easier to show it. Okay, so here's our atomic absorption lines. Um, and also, these are also atomic absorption lines. So it really depends on the atom. Some atomic absorption lines are really wide and really deep. The only reason that molecular absorption lines look wider than atomic absorption lines at low resolution is because molecular absorption lines um, or mo molecules have many more absorption lines than atoms. So every single one of these lines is an absorption line from the same molecule. And um, again, um, in the later lecture where we talk about how spectral lines are formed, um, I'll go into more detail about why molecules have so many absorption lines so close together. Um, but they, so at low resolution, okay, so here you can see at high resolution, there's lots and lots and lots of lines. At low resolution, you can't really tell the difference. And so basically it just looks like this kind of sawtooth pattern, like where it goes down and then kind of comes up at an angle. And um, that's because basically there's tons of absorption lines here but they're very narrow and so we can't um, resolve them. So it just looks like one big absorption line. So on our low resolution spectrum, this kind of characteristic straight down and then kind of slow rise is indicative of, or that's how molecules absorption lines usually look. Um, so that question is kind of jumping ahead to later um, lessons, um, but I kind of just wanted to at the first um, stage, give you a little bit of a taste of what different resolutions look like. Okay, there are no more questions here. There are some congratulations for the lecture of today morning. And uh, I guess uh, uh, what we what is next is uh, we will meet at, in 25 minutes at 1025 and we will go with the labs. Okay? Yes, great. 
Okay, thank you very much and see you in 25 minutes. Yep, see you in 25 minutes.